Hi everyone, this lesson is on the infectious disease known as giardiasis. So giardiasis is also known as beaver fever. It is a gastrointestinal condition due to infection with a protozoa known as giardia intestinalis. This is what this protozoa looks like. And giardia intestinalis was previously known as giardia lamblia or giardia duodenalis. It is a zoonotic infection, meaning that it can come from animals. And it has cross-species infectivity, meaning that if one species is infected, it can spread this organism to other species. And beavers are an important reservoir for this protozoa. And this is the reason why this condition can be called beaver fever. Now, giardiasis is a major cause of diarrhea and is the most common intestinal parasite worldwide. And giardia intestinalis is actually the most common intestinal parasite, at least that is identified and diagnosed in the United States. This condition is more likely to occur in children, so there's a higher prevalence of giardiasis in children. And it's more common in institutionalized settings, meaning that it's more common in daycares, where if there's one child that's infected, they can spread it to other children, or in prisons or hospitalized settings. Now let's talk about the sources of this protozoa and how people become infected. So as mentioned before, beavers act as an important reservoir for this protozoa. And when human beings do become infected with giardia intestinalis, they can actually spread it to other humans. So there is human-to-human -human transmission as well. And other animals can pass giardia intestinalis in their stool, including dogs, cats, and primates. So if there are dogs and cats that are infected with this protozoa, they can spread this protozoa in their stool into the environment to lead to infection of other individuals or other species. And there are other species of giardia. So giardia intestinalis is just one species, but there are many other species of this protozoa that infect other animals. Now, an infected animal or human can pass this protozoa in their stool, and this protozoa can get into the environment in especially outside water sources. So this is going to be a common area where we see this protozoa, this giardia intestinalis. So we can see it in lakes, rivers, streams, and ponds. And in some places, it may be found in up to 80% of these water sources. So we can often see this protozoa being present in contaminated water in especially areas with poor sanitation. So if you're going to drink outside water, it's best to have that water filtered. And we can also see this protozoa not only contaminating water sources, but it can contaminate other consumable objects as well, like food. So this is a reason why we can see high levels of this giardiasis occurring in daycares and some other institutionalized settings because if there's one person that's infected, they can cause contamination into the surrounding environment leading to further infection of other individuals. So this is a reason why we can see this occurring. This leads us into the pathophysiology of this condition. So in the environment, in contaminated water or food or in other objects, there are these giardia intestinalis cysts. And when a patient consumes one of these contaminated objects, they also consume one of these cysts. These cysts will then enter into the gastrointestinal tract and become what we call trophozoites. So trophozoites are going to be the mature form of giardia intestinalis. And these trophozoites will then cause a lot of the signs and symptoms we're going to talk about in the next upcoming slides. But what these trophozoites can also do is that they can travel through the gastrointestinal tract, they can multiply, and then they can themselves become cysts, and then they can be released in the feces of the patient. So they can become cysts again, be released into the environment, and then lead to infection of other individuals. This is how we're going to have this infection continuing to occur. So again, it has to do with consumption of contaminated water, food, or other surfaces. So contaminated water is one, and we can often see with human-to-human -human transmission, we can see fecal-oral transmission. So this is actually going to be the most common. So in Daycare centers, for instance, if one child has giardiasis, they can often spread this protozoa to other children through a fecal-oral transmission route. And this is a highly infective organism. It's been estimated that it may cause infection if as few as 10 organisms are ingested. So this is a reason why we can see outbreaks in institutionalized settings. Let's talk about the clinical features of giardiasis. So this condition may actually be asymptomatic, and it, in fact, it may actually be asymptomatic in a majority of cases, and which is what we would call asymptomatic carriage. So patient simply has it in their gastrointestinal tract. They have giardia intestinalis essentially colonizing their gastrointestinal tract, but they don't have symptoms of it. Now, symptoms may occur in 5 to 70% of patients. There is a wide range here, just 
from many different sources, we can see that it is potentially a minority of cases that actually have symptoms. And there are particular factors that increase the risk of having symptoms. One of them is, interestingly, if the patient has blood group A or type A, so if they're A negative or A positive, they're more likely to have symptoms of giardiasis. If the patient is malnourished in some way, if they are suffering from malnutrition, they're more likely to have this condition as well. If they have any issues with immune system functioning, they're also at an increased risk. If they also suffer from hypochlorhydria, they're also at an increased risk for signs and symptoms. And if they have a high parasite load, so if there's more of these protozoa within their gastrointestinal tract, they're more likely to have symptoms as well. Now let's talk about the clinical features of giardiasis. In patients that do have symptoms, one of the hallmark findings of giardiasis is going to be diarrhea. Now this diarrhea can be acute or chronic. So acute diarrhea is going to be defined as being less than two weeks in duration. Oftentimes, an acute diarrhea is going to be considered as being due to an infection. Whereas chronic diarrhea is going to be defined as more than two to four weeks, and it's oftentimes going to be considered non-infectious. But with regards to giardiasis, this is an interesting case where we can either have acute diarrhea or we can have chronic diarrhea. With regards to early infection, if the patient has had giardiasis for only a week, they would be considered to have acute diarrhea. But this condition can last for weeks to months. So not only could they have acute diarrhea, but over time, they may have chronic diarrhea. So again, very important to recognize that this is one of the infections that can lead to a chronic diarrhea. Now this diarrhea is going to be particular in that it's going to be quite malodorous, and the stool is going to be what is described as greasy. And this is going to be the most common finding in giardiasis occurring in roughly 90% of patients. Some other important and common findings in giardiasis is flatulence, bloating, and abdominal distension. So this is, again, going to be some common findings that occur in estimated 70% of patients who have signs and symptoms. Now, some other findings include malaise and fatigue, anorexia and weight loss. This is going to occur in roughly 50% of patients who have signs and symptoms. And on average, patients will lose 10 pounds or 4.54 kilograms from giardiasis. Now, some other more uncommon findings can include nausea and vomiting and a low-grade fever, which is often going to be rare in this condition. Now, there are some other atypical features of giardiasis, including urticaria. Urticaria are hives, so itchy, raised hives. We can also see sleep issues from this condition, so an example would be insomnia or having difficulty falling asleep. We can also see an association with depression. And then we can also see issues with irritability in patients who have giardiasis as well. These are all going to be more rare and uncommon findings, but the ones we talked about previously are going to be the more common findings we're going to see in this condition. So how do clinicians diagnose and treat this condition? So the diagnosis is going to require some clinical suspicion. If the patient has a history of going out and camping and they drink outside water for some reason, this is going to be a typical characteristic story of a patient with giardiasis, where they've gone out recently camping, have drank water from a lake or from some water source outside, for instance. And the way to diagnose giardiasis is going to be through stool, ova, and parasites. So looking at the stool to see if there are those eggs or cysts and the parasites themselves. So we may see something like this where we see giardia intestinalis trophozoites or the cysts. Now, another way to diagnosis is through stool antigen testing. So an ELISA can be performed, so enzyme-linked immunosorbent assay. So this is often going to be in the case where stool ova and parasites haven't shown any sign of the trophozoites or the cysts, but there's still clinical suspicion as to whether or not the patient does have giardiasis. So they can often do a stool antigen test in those certain circumstances. And when clinicians have diagnosed this condition, Fluids and dehydration are going to be important. Oftentimes, patients may have excessive diarrhea. They may be dehydrated. It's going to be important to do fluid resuscitation. So keeping hydrated is going to be important. And the first-line agent for treating this condition is going to be metronidazole. This is going to be the textbook answer for treating giardiasis. So again, it's the first-line treatment. And other possible treatments, instead of metronidazole, can include tinidazole. Now, I do want to mention here that it's possible that even after treating giardiasis, patients can have issues with what we call post-infection lactase deficiency. Oftentimes, even after finishing treatment of giardiasis, they can have issues with consistent or repeating episodes of diarrhea. 
So in some cases, we may see patients being diagnosed with irritable bowel syndrome after they've had an infection with giardiasis. So there can be post-infection lactase deficiency. Lactase is going to be the enzyme that helps break down lactose. So they can essentially become lactose intolerant. And this can last for many months, even after completion of treatment for this condition. So it can often be helpful for patients is being put on a lactose-free diet for at least several months to see if that helps with some of the recurrent episodes of diarrhea, for instance. So I do want to mention that here. This can be a common complication after having giardiasis, this post-infection lactase deficiency. And we can often see issues with chronic diarrhea even after this has been effectively treated. So if you want to learn more about other infectious diseases, please check out my infectious disease playlist. And if you haven't already, please like and subscribe for more lessons like this one. Thanks so much for watching and hope to see you next time.